The next item on the agenda, for us who didn't really understand last year what megatrends are, Dorman Follow will, will try to explain for us once more what is megatrends. For you who remember what megatrends is, and for, oh no, once more with Dorman, I can promise you that it's going to be a lot of new and interesting stuff presented today. So, a continuation from last year, welcome up on the scene, Dorma Followell. Thank you. Well, let me begin by saying what a joy it is to be back at the Enix Fair. My first experience last year at Malmo was a tremendous experience. I presented 10 different megatrends. Whenever I introduce this, I, I have to forewarn you a little bit. There will be a tremendous amount of information coming your way. This is a little bit like drinking water from a fire hose. But I will, I will try to go slowly enough, and I'm also going to try to end early so that we can get a few questions in. What we will do today is focus on four of the ten megatrends that we covered last time. We've decided to look at four that we, the team at Enix and I, felt like the, were the most interesting, the most relevant to our audience today. And so we're going to be covering them with some similar information, but with a lot of new analysis. We're also going to be taking a little bit more of a global view. We'll be looking at the implications of some of these trends in major emerging markets, such as India and Africa. And I think we'll have an interesting sort of world uh, journey, a world tour over the next uh, 50 minutes or so on four top megatrends of the future. And then at the end, I'll step back and think through how you might be able to leverage this in your own environment. And then we will uh, get a chance to take a little bit of a breather. So let's look at our f top four megatrends of the future. The first one is urbanization. I'm going to spend the longest t amount of time on this because this trend is a massive trend. This trend is not a trend that we sort of came up with on our own, although these megatrends do come up from a bottom-up research process at Frost & Sullivan. Frost & Sullivan has been described by one of its major clients in Europe, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, as a, an unparalleled provider of, of market intelligence. We won a three-year tender recently with the Fraunhofer Institute. We asked, why did we win? And they said, very simple. No other firm covers as many industry verticals across as many metrics of measurement in as many geographies as Frost and Sullivan. And when we were looking at our vertical analysis, we started to realize that certain trends cut across the verticals and were more horizontal. Those we saw from our bottom-up research process as the megatrends that will determine the future. And urbanization touches literally every single one of the industry verticals that we track. It is a massive trend. In fact, it's such a massive trend that we actually need to break it down and look at three main sub-trends within this. So the first sub-trend that we see is the development of the megacity and how marketers are increasingly starting to focus on mega cities as key marketing targets. So a mega city can be defined with a city of a minimum population of 8 million and a GDP of 250 million in 2025. What's also defining a mega city, if you will, is a lot of infrastructure. You see typically it's defined as a ring, by a ring road. You see both an urban center as well as suburban environments. You see multiple airports. This, the city that we have here is Greater London. Four airports that serve that, that area. And it's, it's a very, very rich, actually five if you think of city airport as well. It's a, it's a very rich environment. And so a, a tremendous contributor to the overall GDP of the UK. Now, in addition to mega cities, we see mega regions. Mega regions are where you have two major cities fairly closely located that over time blend together and create a very rich economic hub between two cities. So in South Africa, what we've pictured here is you have Johannesburg and Pretoria joining together to form a mega region already called Jotoria. Again, what you want to look at with this is you can see one, two, three, four airports. 
you see a tremendous amount of infrastructure coming together. I presented these slides a couple months ago in uh, Dubai, and we were interviewed afterwards, and one of the major trends that we saw in that part of the world was the combination of Dubai and Abu Dhabi. That creates a mega region that really is the heart and soul of the UAE over time. So mega regions are important. Then we have mega corridors. Now mega corridors are a concept that we in the US are very familiar with. I grew up understanding the corridor of power in the United States up in the Northeast, which is Washington DC, the political power, to New York, the financial power, to Boston, the intellectual power. We see corridors like that cropping up literally all over the world. And these corridors can again become a major focal point for marketers thinking, I may not want to go into all of China, but by golly, I'll go into the mega corridor that includes Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou. Why? 120 million people live in that corridor. In European terms, that's Italy and the UK in those three cities. Not a bad idea for a marketer to con consider focusing there, right? I mean, it is a daunting task to go into all of China. It's a little less daunting to look at this mega corridor, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Guangzhou. So we are breaking down the trend of urbanization into these three sub-trends, mega city, mega regions, mega corridors. Now let's look at some mega corridors, since I was just talking about that. By 2050, there's the Northeast Corridor that I was talking about, the Corridor of Power in the U.S. Look at how many across the U.S. there are. More importantly, though, we see tremendous numbers of, of mega corridors across all the developing regions. In India, one way to think about India is not necessarily just as India as a whole, like, again, trying to think about going into India. Actually, you think about the Golden Quadrilateral of Delhi, Calcutta, Mumbai, and Chennai. Those four cities are the dominant GDP producers in India. And so again, you simplify and target your marketing efforts and your understanding of how to enter, enter a country market by looking at mega corridors and uh, mega cities, if you will. There's the Dubai Abu Dhabi corridor that I was talking about. Uh, and then of course we see uh, we see down in, in uh, South Africa, or sorry, in uh, South America, we have the, the Sao Paulo to Rio corridor as well. So you can see that across the world, the concept of the mega corridor will grow in importance, and that's part of an overall trend in urbanization. Now, one of the things I wanted to do to add some spice to this was to do some country-specific analysis. So around 38% of the total population in India will live in urban regions in 2025. This is the increased urbanization of what is today a predominantly rural population in India. Cities will account for 70% of India's GDP in 2030. And if you look at this, what you have here is you have the mega cities in 2025 are the big red dots, Delhi, Calcutta, and Mumbai. And then you see sort of regions and, and urbanization rates around these that talk about how you know, the urbanization rate of the highly urban states and megacities in any 2025 will look about like this. And so when you're thinking about India and thinking about a market entry strategy into India, you think about these, these four key megacities and then the rich environment around them. Now, it's interesting that the south part here, Chennai, is very, very close. I would call that a megacity as well. I have to quibble with our research team a little bit on that. I think there are really four. On this slide, they talk about three. But that's looking at just what India will look like in 2025. It's very important that we continue to keep our eyes on the BRIC countries. In many ways, a lot of people are trying to say, let's look beyond BRIC but I believe the BRIC countries are still going to be the major areas of focus. There are new up-and-comers. There's Indonesia, there's Turkey. There are other places, but we do want to focus continually in the next decade at least, and the main emerging markets are going to really be the BRIC markets. So what this looks like in terms of, of mega regions, we see mega regions and potential mega regions uh, that, we, that are emerging over time. So. Mega regions in 2025 are, uh oh, there we go, are the ones with the red circle and then the multiple uh, orange. Then potential mega regions, Hyderabad, Sekunderabad, and you know, then the potential mega regions after 2030 would then be uh, up, up 
in the northwest corridor. And this is how you see kind of, again, a snapshot of how this will impact the India market between 2025 all the way up to 2030. Now, another aspect of urbanization that is very, very important and a concept that you're going to hear a lot today is the concept of smart. So over 40 global cities will be smart cities in 2020. And more than 50% of smart cities by 2025 will be from Europe and North America. This is a concept that has been very, very largely developed in our part of the world, if you will, between in Europe in particular, but also in the US. This slide for me is a great slide because I can track my, my own life cycle through this slide. I was raised in the city called Boulder, Colorado until I was 18 when I went to school in the Bay Area, which is the San Francisco area. And then a few years ago, five years ago, moved to what I consider to be greater London. I live in Oxford, which is sort of the outer ring of London. And if you see, uh, particularly in Europe, you see a tremendous focus of, uh, you know, green stars. Those are existing eco-cities. Uh, we're going to study Copenhagen here in a minute as a classic example of a very smart city doing some very interesting things. <laughs> Amsterdam as well. So as we look at the future between now and 2025, there will not only be increased urbanization and an influx of population into urban areas, but there will be entirely new cities that are built on a smart model. Smart being incredibly rich infrastructure, smart being eco-friendly, and <clears throat> we're going to see those kind of megacities developed, and some will be cities built from scratch, like you see in the red stars here will be smart cities that have essentially been built from scratch recently. And so at that place, you get to really define it from the ground up. Very exciting, great opportunities for business, great opportunities for infrastructure development, great opportunities for widespread sensor, camera, and IT infrastructure within those kind of environments. So cities, not countries, will drive wealth creation over time. So, as we look at the basic facts about cities, why is this trend our number one mega trend out of the gate? Because it is a virtual guarantee. By 2020, 60% of the world's population will be urban, as much as 70% by, say, 2030, 2040. So this is a major trend, no question. Also, the cities have become the economic generators, the core generators of GDP in their country. So cities like Seoul, account for 50% of the country's GDP. Budapest and Hungary, Brussels and Belgium for each account for roughly 45% of GDP in their countries. Also, some of the implications that come from this are here. High economic power with 85% of scientific and technology innovation coming from cities. Very important. New mobility solutions. I'm gonna talk about urban mobility here in a minute. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, we had the data points earlier today about the burgeoning strength of the automotive industry. Well, the future of the automotive industry in many ways is urban mobility. And the automotive industry has got this in a big way. So, uh, very excited, exciting world to look at. So let me pick up uh, a case study of a major European company that not only has seen this megatrend, but has restructured itself dramatically around this. This is the case study of Siemens infrastructure in cities. So Siemens is now starting to focus on the city as a customer, and in fact has redesigned itself. They see the city market as 1.7 trillion euro, a spending of roughly 2 trillion per year in terms of global infrastructure around cities, and Siemens think that they can chase 300 billion euro of that spend. Now, when we talk about mega trends, this is a mega opportunity. And Siemens has become a mega company chasing that with a new organization. Look at their revenues are already expected, 16.5 billion, 81,000 employees and 70 city account managers. Very interesting to think about account managers. We think about account managers in terms of major accounts. These guys are starting to think about account ma uh, managers in terms of city account managers. So there would be one guy who would organize everything that Siemens offers in London. What do they offer in London? Well, 
They provide research for unique urban solutions, innovative and customized city concepts that they sell to mayors and urban planners. Additional focus markets that they look at include data centers, hospitality, smart buildings, rail infrastructure, airport, harbors and logistic hubs, road and city mobility, and municipalities. So, let's pick up this issue of mobility. The future of the automotive world and the future of, sit of the mega cities are coming together. So we see a major subtrend here as urban mobility. Well, what will urban mobility look like over time? Well, it's multimodal commuting, combining door-to-door -door solutions using dedicated mobility platforms. So as you see here, your destination is here, but usually you live sort of outside. So there will be a, a multi-mobility integrated structure, and the whole point is for vehicle manufacturers to start offering smart mobility solutions at either ends, ensuring first and last mile connectivity. Whereas the, you know, the, the public infrastructure will take care of the middle, they'll talk about the first mile and the last mile. Very interesting. We also believe the market will see in the urban environment new players in a market that we're terming mobility integrators. What might that look like? Well, we believe that in the urban mobility world in the future, there will be a lot of different stakeholders that will need to start combining together products and services, start partnering in ways that have actually never been seen before. As we were studying these trends, the trends of urbanization and the trends of mobility and how the future of those two are coming together in urban mobility, we started to realize that actually a mobility integrator is needed to bring together transport operators on the public side, telecom operators, online mobility booking agencies, payment engines, and technology solutions providers to bring all of those together to create a seamless customer experience where one mobility integrator can bring them all together and go to market. I've presented this very slide at places like Ericsson up in Stockholm. I've presented this very slide in places like BT uh, Global Services, their every six month strategy session. And in both places, I said right now we see a space for a mobility integrator. And we whacked right in the Ericsson logo and the BT logo to help them consider could they be the first ever genuine mobility integrator. Very interesting, the BT guy said, oh yeah, well we already do this. We're kings in mobility. And I said, actually what we're talking about is automotive. We're talking about transport. We're talking about urban mobility. See, he was talking about mobile comms, right? And see, this is a different way of thinking. It's mobility in a different sense and urban mobility. Now the future of urban mobility is for a very rich infrastructure like what you see here. It's going to be green, integrated, and interoperable transport infrastructure that can best be defined as smart. And it will look like this. Now, I'm going to let you look at this for a second, and I'm going to tell you a little story about this slide. I had a lot of fun with this slide about three months ago. In the beginning of March, we were invited to headline a debate at Oxford University's Sade Business School about the future of the driverless car. And so Frost and Sullivan came, and I presented, and what I said was, I believe that the primordial soup out of which the driverless car will emerge and evolve, if you will, will be a very rich infrastructure environment that will include the following, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communications, real-time information services, vehicle management systems, intermodal communication platforms, app store services, passenger information, safety systems, and IT infrastructure that provides all of that, adaptive cruise control, one of the major technologies to get us to the driverless car, trip planning, etc. You see that the urban mobility world of the future will be incredibly infrastructure rich with highly enabled sensor and sensor fusion technologies with vast comm structures, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, infrastructure to infrastructure, all sorts of rich infrastructure, and out of that will come the driverless car of the future. Now, the minute I said all this and I posited our view, a robotics professor at Oxford University stood up right after me and said, Dorman, I'm going to debate you now. I completely disagree. I think the artificial intelligence on board in the car 
will allow it to operate driverless and infrastructure free. And so we had this very interesting debate at Oxford. Personally, I think he's a little academic. <laughs> I think this is the world that urban mobility will come around and, and look like. So that's our first mega trend. Now, picking up the concept of smart, we want to now look at our second mega trend, which is smart is the new green. We know that over the last decade, the concept of green has gotten a tremendous amount of press. It's gotten a tremendous amount of investment, thinking time on the part of management. With the crisis, some of that sort of got put aside. And I think what emerges from that is actually a smart world replacing the green world. Now, when we talk about smart, what are we talking about? We're talking about ubiquitous application of sensor technology and sensor fusion network technology in a whole host of environments. You're talking about very rich infra IT infrastructure making the smart aspect. And how this plays out, we just talked about that a little bit in smart cities. Uh, we talked about it just now in smart mobility. You see smart materials right there. The slide that I began with is a bendable lighting device, bendable electronics from Philips Lighting. Very, very interesting. New uh, bendable materials that are smart with multiple applications we can barely even think about yet. You have smart bandages in the healthcare space. What is that? It's a bandage with a temperature sensor built in so that if the wound site starts to increase in temperature, the bandage itself will turn red to tell you that there may be the onset of infection as early as possible. If it's green, the wound is healing the right way. If it's red, you better get some, some, you know, some sort of topical ointment to make sure that you, you reduce the potential infection and nail it as early as possible. That's actually a classic example of what's going on in healthcare now. That's a prevention rather than a find it and fix it cure once the symptoms present. It's more preventative. That's smart bandages. We see smart buildings. Uh, in a couple minutes, our colleague uh, from ABB will talk about smart grids. I can't wait to hear what she says. Got to see a couple of the slides, and it's a very similar story than some of the things that we see. Obviously, we also know about smart clouds on the IT side, and then, of course, smartphones getting smarter every day. So now let's look at the factory of the future, which combines some of the same exact elements. It's actually smart and green. So it's flexibility and capacity and robotic technology combined with artificial intelligence. So the current plant looks something like this. The future plant, the future will lower production costs and shorten innovation and production cycles. How? With work simulation, so 10% decreases in production time. With premium efficiency class motors, pumps and compressors, all requiring lower voltage drives. Remote support and diagnosis of production equipment. So you have a, a much richer monitoring system that doesn't, doesn't require sort of on-ground monitoring but can be diagnosed and supported remotely and a virtual reality-based maintenance and planning. So you see, you know, again, combinations of, you know, ubiquitous sensor technology, wireless, much richer IT infrastructure guiding the factory of the future, the smart factory of 2020. Now again, we see smart market opportunities. Just like smart mobility and the mobility integrator idea, we see that former competitors may well view the future not so antagonistically, but actually much more from a partner ecosystem uh, viewpoint, saying that, you know, the telecom players need to be thinking about how they can interact with the IT players who need to think about the energy and infrastructure players who need to think about the automation and building control players. So traditional competitors ought to be thinking that, you know, if I'm Siemens, I really ought to be talking to SAP and Google. And in fact, actually, I can combine on some things with my competitor Honeywell in, in, in the past. And, and then maybe we bring on board O2 to help enable some of the comms on this. And again, what we see here is the pink spot. When you're listening to these megatrends presentations, what you want to think about is white space that may be existing between 
these megatrends where they come together, the way urbanization and the future of automotive came together in urban mobility. Likewise, there's white space at points of convergence, and the points of convergence can be where megatrends converge, but also where industries come together, driven by the megatrends in order to serve new client bases. And again, when I've, uh, when I've worked on this in the past, uh, we actually sold a megatrends workshop as part of the strategic planning process to a division of Honeywell when I moved Honeywell right up to the spot here and said, we think you have an opportunity to lead the space here. Because you know what? The business world of the future is not about just doing the same old stuff. It's actually saying, you know, like an ice hockey player can focus just only on where the puck is. But what made Wayne Gretzky the greatest hockey player ever and why they called him the great one, and they asked him, why do they call you the great one? He said, it's very simple. I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck will be. He had a three to four second visionary advantage. And when you're looking at these megatrends, the whole point of this, these presentations is to give you a visionary advantage. And you can think about white space opportunities for you or your client bases. You can actually use these, if you're a salesperson, to sell in new and interesting ways based on mega trends and getting you and your clients to skate not to where the puck is, but where the puck will be. Okay, third mega trend is innovating to zero. How many of you have ever heard this concept? Those of you who are in Malmo might remember me saying this. Okay. When you first hear this, you're going, okay, what was Dorman drinking in his coffee at lunch? It sounds strange. This concept was actually spawned by the mind, one of the great minds of our generation, Bill Gates. He was the first one who presented this concept at a TED conference. Let me explain exactly what innovating to zero is. Usually when we look to innovate, we think about step changes, going from current product and technology and known needs to relatively close adjacencies and making small steps. So we're going from A to B to C to D, and that's how we go forward. Well, this thought process is actually the exact opposite and say, look, where do you really want to go? Erase the whiteboard completely and say, what is a great goal that you would want to achieve for your company or for humanity? Pick a zero goal out there, like a city deciding it will be carbon neutral by 2025, like a country deciding that they will not allow any hospital-borne infections anymore. Zero goal of zero hospital-borne infections, for example. So see, the innovating to zero concept is actually turning the innovation completely around and saying, where do you want to be? And you think about where you want to be, what's great for your company, what's great for humanity. Start at the Z point and then work backward to A to figure out what, it gotta, what has to happen to get you from A to Z. But instead of starting at A, B, C, D with step change, you start all the way at the end with the zero goal in mind and then you backward chain to it. This can be one of the most stimulating ways of creatively envisioning not only your future, but also how to innovate to get to that future. One of my favorite quotes from Steve Jobs that I read in a eulogy just after he passed was this. He said, it is not about predicting the future. It's about inventing the future. And let's face it, they built the highest market cap company in the world on that kind of philosophy. They also spent, interestingly enough, the first four hours of every week, Monday morning for four hours, week in and week out, 10% of their entire production time, if you will, thinking about the future. They thought a whole lot about the future. And so we want to think more about the future and think about what should the future look like. And so let's consider this. So on this slide, we're going to apply some ideas. Let's look at some zero goals. I mentioned one, zero hospital-borne infections. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. Because in a place like India, at any one point in time, roughly 1.3 million patients suffer from a hospital-borne infection. Think about that. It's a huge number. So we, they ought to try to zero that out in my mind. What about zero breaches of security? 
I know the guys preparing for the London Olympics would love to have that be a reality for them. Zero defects on a production line. Another zero goal that I worked with down the road uh, with some Swiss engineers last year at Anderson Hauser. I had a workshop around innovating to zero and these guys were struggling a little bit with me to get this and I said, well look, let's just think about what are your biggest problems right now? They said downtime. I said, what else? They said, customer complaints. I said, okay, there are our zero goals. Let's work from the goal of zero downtime and let's backward chain to what it would take. And let's work from the goal of zero customer complaints and let's figure out what it would take. See, when you think it that way, then you can, you can have a very inspiring process. And I got to tell you, we had a lot of fun. We came up with about 20 or 30 different growth opportunities for Anderson Hauser around those zero goals. That's why you want to be thinking about this in your world. Uh, zero accidents. You know, this is something with widespread deployment of sensors in cars. Uh, the future of zero accidents is actually quite possible technologically. You know, and when it comes to the driverless car and we get the main cause of accidents you and me and other people out of the system, there could be a zero accident world. Very interesting. I think that's about 100 years off, but it could happen. Zero obese patients. Obesity is such a huge issue. I mean, you think about all the zero goals. Now let's look at some examples. Examples of innovating to zero. Zero energy building. Off the grid buildings. On-site energy harvest. Use of intelligent systems. Very interesting. Zero defects I talked about before. Zero accidents. Uh, a company called ATOS, an IT player, has been so buried under the flow of emails. You know what ATOS has taken as a zero goal? Zero emails. <laughs> I love that. I mean, yes, yes. You know what? I'm going to feed this back. The minute I said that about ATOS, they got a round of applause. The, the ATOS guys are feeling good right now who are thinking about this. But I completely agree with that. I mean, the reality is we're drowning under information, so there needs to be filtering. And zero emails, what an interesting concept. Now, here's an example, a case study, Copenhagen, the world's first carbon neutral city by 2025. That's their vision. No net CO2 emissions by 2025, first ever. And in, that's their goal. That's a zero goal that they have set for themselves, and they're well on their way to achieving that goal in 2025, and they have these five work streams to get there. So integrating climate and into energy supply, greener transport, energy efficient buildings, Copenhageners and climate, and then urban development. I mean, look at that. So again, what they did, they took a zero goal and they figured out all the different work streams to get there. Very interesting. And you want to be thinking about how you in your environment can suggest a zero goal or maybe suggest a zero goal to your clients or your customers and help them to think more innovatively about their space. Okay, the fourth and uh, in some ways the uh, richest at some level mega trend that we're going to talk about is infrastructure development. Now we're gonna look at this in a lot of different ways and I'm going to focus in a big way on Africa here because I believe the single greatest opportunity for infrastructure development in the decade ahead is, in fact, the next couple of decades is in Africa. But let's begin and talk about this now. Let's look at the high-speed rail market as an overview of this globally. Now, in the next 10 years, Spain, China, and the U.S. are the top three investors in new rail infrastructure, totaling, look at that number, $263 billion in the next 10 years. Very, very interesting. Now, what is interesting to me, though, on this slide, and one of the key stories of this slide, again, we want to look at things not only in places like Africa, we want to look at things in what's going on here in Europe. Look at the boxes here. This data is very surprising to me. The one region that gets the value of high-speed rail infrastructure and is building and designing around that, even here in Zurich, we were just talking yesterday, I mean, all the, the tunneling that's going on and all of this. Tremendously uh, interesting high-speed rail uh, investment. I mean, in South America, 87 billion earmarked. North America, 137 billion. Middle East, 107. And then second is Asia Pac at 166. But what's amazing to me about this slide is the commitment in Europe 
for high-speed rail infrastructure build. That is a very, very substantial data point, I think. And you can see this as, you know, kind of across the board. Uh, so, you know, high-speed rail market countrywide, cumulative investments on rail infrastructure globally, 2011 to 2020. So, fascinating stuff. A lot of new rail infrastructure right in our own backyard. Very interesting business opportunity right there, I would say. Now, one of the things that we're going to see again is the combined opportunity of some of these megatrends where they come together. So what we're going to see coming together in the Trans-Siberian Railroad situation is a highly expanded rail network, the hubs of which are megacities. So you see the, the integration of the Trans-Siberian Rail into the Eurasian nail work, uh, Rail Network will result in industrial and business hubs along the road, and one of these will be one of the great megacities in Russia, which is Ekaterinburg. Another one will be Novosibirsk. And what you have, again, in Ekaterinburg, you have the classic megacity definition. High GDP producer, ring road, multiple, you know, uh, kind of urban centers, but also suburban areas, great and rich infrastructure, airports, rail, road, etc. Very interesting. So this we see as, again, a combining point. So if you are looking and you have customers that are looking at high-speed rail and rail development, you want to think not only about the rail development, but you want to think about the megacities along the way and what kind of products and services can be either produced in the megacities or sold into the megacities, the hubs along the way. Now, I said I would talk a lot about Africa in this situation. The reason that I want to talk about Africa is because there's a whole lot of smart money in the world that's betting a whole lot on African infrastructure. This morning, one of our colleagues said, did anyone in the world call the global crisis? Did anyone see this coming? Well, I got to tell you, in early February 2007, I was sitting with a very, very smart venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. This was a guy who had gotten very wealthy during the dot-com era, and had also invested $1.5 million about 10 years ago in a little Chinese company called Baidu. Anyone ever heard of Baidu? It's the massive Chinese search engine company that's just come out with a handheld phone. Market cap of roughly $15 billion. Now, right about now, all of us investors are thinking, how do you go from $1.5 million to $15 billion? These guys are smart money guys. And in early February 2007, he looked at me and he said, everything that we're being told is that the world is on the edge of a serious economic calamity. And so you want to be thinking about that, about the future. Interesting. Those guys called it. So what is that guy doing now with all of his uh, hundreds of millions that he invests? He's focusing all of his efforts right here. Infrastructure development in Africa. Water power, hydroelectric power plants in dangerous places like uh, the Congo and you know, the, the you know, DRC and all these other different places. So it's fascinating. Why is he doing this? Because Africa will no longer be the blackout continent. From 70% of sub-Saharan population without electricity in 2010 to 70% with electricity by 2020. This is just a massive opportunity. So the business opportunity here is bring light into communities. 350 million people in Africa alone. Uh, back in August, I was doing an event, our own growth, innovation, and leadership event that I was uh, headlining down in our Cape Town office. And I spent a lot of time with a guy from Schneider Electric. And he just said, I'm down here, and we're providing infrastructure in Africa. He said, I am going to have the best next 20 years of my life because there's just decades worth of opportunity in infrastructure development in Africa. Straight from the horse's mouth. Very, very interesting. So infrastructure development is a massive megatrend, and where it will play itself out more than any other region will be in Africa. But it also will play itself out right here in our backyard in Europe, as we saw from the high-speed rail example. Now, this is one of my favorite slides that our team has ever developed. I feel like this is just a flipping cool slide, isn't it? Look at how many data points are on this slide. You want to know everything there is to know about Africa, there it is, pretty much. 
I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I feel like we could spend probably 20 minutes on this slide, and we genuinely could. But I think, you know, Africa in a nutshell is what this is called. What we see up in this corner here is the infrastructure development side. So 220 million, the number of Africans who are only able to meet basic needs, but who will become consumers by 2015. That's a big market right there. Look at Africa's share of the world's uncultivated arable land. Look at the agriculture opportunity in Africa. My goodness. Not only infrastructure, but agriculture as well. Uh, just absolutely fascinating. So, you know, look at the, the change here. Percentage of African households with discretionary spending power from 35 to 43 just in the last decade, and that will, of course, pop up from there. Four major leading countries there in terms of population in millions, average growth, and then GNP in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and Algeria. What was interesting to me was $52 billion of foreign direct investment in Africa in 2010, almost as large as the flow into China relative to GDP. So a lot going in to Africa, no question. You will get this slide later, so I'm not going to read anymore, but it's just a fascinating slide. Africa will be a major environment for infrastructure development. Now, who will the trade partners be coming into and working with the infrastructure development in Africa? Well, who would we expect? China is now Africa's single biggest trading partner. Let me tell you, the Chinese are the most butt-kicking business people in the world. They see Africa. They're all over Africa. I love that. It's fascinating to watch the smart money going into Africa from places like Silicon Valley, the smart investment, the smart, smart movement from countries like China saying, hey, we know how to develop infrastructure. We're going to go into Africa and help them develop. Absolutely fascinating. But also here in our own backyard, the European Union is the largest regional partner, accounting for 40.8% of Africa's exports and 42.2% of Africa's imports. However, that is on the wane. And then the U.S. side as well. So, I mean, you know, clearly it's interesting. One of the things that's fascinating is what's called the south-to-south -South exchanges increasingly driving Africa's international trade growth. So 28% of Africa's trade now is south-to-south -south trade with Asia. Now, in terms of infrastructure spending specifically in Africa, we'll total $1.1 trillion from 2005 to 2030. And what is the biggest part of that infrastructure spend is on the power side. So half a trillion during that period, roughly 45% of the total investment. So definitely the largest. The next is road and retail. And then you have water and air and seaports. So more than 60% of this expenditure is funded by African sources, including private companies and taxpayers. So interesting, interesting stuff in Africa on the infrastructure side. Now what about India on the infrastructure side? Well, the investment trends from 2007 to 2017 look like this. The main thing you want to see about this slide is that from 2007 to 2012, the last five years, the infrastructure spend was $513 billion. What will happen in the next five years? It will almost exactly double to just over, uh, one, you know, just over $1 trillion, so $1.024 billion or just over $1 trillion. So where will that happen primarily? Well, you see all the different breakdowns in terms of the types of infrastructure. But really, pretty much across the board, you see that electricity is roughly doubling. Roads and bridge, bridges, a little more than double, or right at roughly doubling again. So, you know, you see that actually it's fairly proportional how that is, uh, how that infrastructure spend will be spent across different sort of application areas in India. So, what are the key strategic conclusions from all of this? I know, like I said, it's been a bit of a whirlwind tour, drinking water from a fire hose. Thank heaven you get the slides afterwards. But what are some of the key conclusions? Well, I've been saying all morning, or all afternoon, I guess, after lunch now, that the megatrends are interconnected, intertwined, suggesting synergies between them. The white space opportunities that I think are the most interesting. The integrator opportunities where people can skate to where the puck will be, not where it is. It's also important to understand the ecosystem of a mega trend, what the overall value chain looks like, and the elements of the value chain which have most profitability. 
All these trends are definitely globalized trends. I've demonstrated that in some of the key emerging market areas, and they have global ramifications and are therefore scalable. These forces are definitely changing rapidly and changing more rapidly every day. One thing about the future is that it's getting harder and harder to predict the asymmetrical future, but one thing we can predict pretty certainly is that it's getting faster and faster and more and more complicated. We're going to deal with that in the next Megatrends presentation, but that's one thing about the future here. Organizations also, we believe, need Megatrend champions. We actually already have one at Enix. Enix, his name is Petri Arpanen. Hello, Petri, wherever you are. I think he's staying at home with Finland with the birth of his second child any moment. But we already have guys that are in, in this environment, Megatrends champion. We want to suggest that to pretty much every one of our companies that we interact with. Get somebody in your organization or a team within your organization to track this. Siemens does this with a dedicated team. Ericsson does this with a dedicated team. Very important consideration. And then it's important, we believe, to build a healthy ecosystem around your opportunity related to a megatrend, as it can be a source of competitive advantage, but also raise barriers to entry for your, you know, for your competitors. So, you know, App Store Advantage versus Google, for example. And then what you want to do is you want to start thinking how to go from the big data that I've presented, the macro trend, breaking it down to sub-trends like I did immediately with urbanization into mega cities, mega corridors, and mega regions, and then looking at how that impacts on your specific industry, how you can target markets in that way, and then how that can you know, be integrated into your product and service planning for your future portfolio of products and services, and then how that will help you to map to where the puck will be not where it is, in terms of analyzing opportunities and unmet needs. Now, I think we got to 50 minutes, hopefully pretty much right on the, the moment. And uh, that just gives you some ideas of all the megatrends work we're doing. Sorry, it's not a sales presentation. Oops. <laughs> that snuck in there. Wasn't supposed to. But we're now at questions and answers. So, Peter, if you have any questions, or anyone from the audience will... Uh, We'll try to field them as best we can. It's a pretty high odds, but I have a question for you. But I would really like to see if anyone else has any questions. If you just wait a second, we will get a microphone to you so everybody hears me. Here's a microphone well. coming up right here. Thank you. Here. In the urbanization, you mentioned these red dots where you said new cities will develop. What, what is the basis for these new cities? Then? Well, it's it's... Uh, an example I could use was the visionary development of the Mazdar city in Abu Dhabi, which was designed to be, you know, a very, very ecologically efficient city. So they designed it from that perspective from the ground up. Uh, likewise, another example I would take is the showcase city of China, Shenzhen. So in the 1970s, the premier of China you know, held a news conference, pointed to a map, put his finger on a fishing village that had virtually no infrastructure, no nothing except fishing nets and huts and, you know, a relatively poor population. He said, we are going to build our showcase city here. And I tell you, when you go to Shenzhen today, it is amazing. I've had the privilege of meeting with the mayor of Shenzhen, and I mean, when you're sitting there, you're going, this thing was a fishing village 40 years ago. And look at what it is today, literally world-class city designed from the ground up and designed with as many smart design elements as possible. You know, it is the showcase of the new China, if you will. So that's, when you see those red, red stars, that's what we're talking about, is cities that really didn't exist in the form, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but exist now. By the way, some of those are tremendous successes like Shenzhen, and some of those are not such great successes. The Mazdar city is not such a great success. When I was in Dubai, I was going to use a case study about the Mazdar city, and they nearly took my head off. They said, don't mention that over here. <laughs> and I said, okay, okay. <laughs> because, you know, it hasn't lived up to its, to its dreams. But nonetheless, you know, this type of development is something that we see. And I think, you know, it's very exciting to see, you know, urban planners and, and governments thinking about how to create the, the, sit, the smart city of the future. So that, that would be an answer to that. Uh, there's a question right here. Yes. The question is that, uh, first of all, thank you for your slide uh, regarding Africa. That's great. But how do you see 
uh, the potentials, the risk of the high corruption, the fragmented Africa, the political and economical instability influencing all this development, and how do you see the companies to take the risk of all these factors? Thank that you. is a brilliant question, and if you don't mind, I'm going to look at that question very specifically when I come back and do the megatrends of the mind, body, and soul. Because I think there are issues of widespread corruption that actually need to be dialed into all of this. But in Africa in particular, the future of Africa can only be fully realized when the corruption, country by country, gets dialed down. There's no question, you've hit what I think is, a, is an underlying megatrend, if you will. You know, that issue of corruption is huge. That problem, by the way, is not an Africa-only problem. I haven't approved to you in a few minutes. It's a massive global issue. And it's an issue that humanity's got to deal with big time. So if you don't mind, maybe we can return to that toward the end, but I, because my next presentation talks a fair amount about that. But don't okay. forget the question if Dorma will forget it, so. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, well, well uh, I will try to reference that as best I can when we're doing it. Good, any more? Hi, so you mentioned the good and bad examples of megacities, mega regions, and uh, I live in Stockholm. They've been talking about making this ring forever and that takes a lot of time to build the infrastructure. If you start with a fishing village and you build it from the ground up, you can take, consider everything. But all over the world, this whole presentation, you have the problem with pollution, waste handling. The whole world is dependent on gas. What are your thoughts on that? I think this is a very, very important point. Let, let, me, let me explain something that I addressed when I was in Dubai talking about this very thing. When I was in Dubai, the first time three years ago. As I was flying out of Dubai, I was flying with one of our uh, experts on the energy and environment side, and he said, Dorman, when you look at Dubai, I want to ask you a question. How much excess water capacity do you think Dubai has? He goes, let me give you an example. When we land in the UK tonight, the UK, given all of its you know, rainfall and all the reservoirs, has at any point in time four to six months of excess water capacity. He said, South Africa, a relatively arid climate, has 28 to 30 days of excess water capacity. Now, Dorman, how much excess water capacity do you think there is in Dubai? I said, John, I have no idea. He said, two to three days. And I'm going, oh my gosh. So when I was interviewed about this Dubai, Abu Dhabi, you know, sort of uh, mega region coming together, and forming the heart and soul of the UAE economically. I then said, but you know what? If I were the leader of this region, I would stop everything else until I added zeros to the number of days of excess water capacity. Right now it's two to three, it ought to be 20 to 30. Because what the heck are they doing? They're building you know, ski resorts, the biggest refrigerator in the world is in Dubai, <laughs> with guys skiing, and I'm going, you're doing that with only two to three? Days of excess water capacity. I mean, if they had an enemy, you got to think about this in defense terms, right? If you're a leader of the country. If they had an enemy, one bombing sortie of three desalination plants, and that city is on its knees. And you literally couldn't get enough water. I mean, it's just, to me, it's incredible. Then I realized, uh, right after making that bold statement to the media, I went home and read the newspaper and found out that a guy got thrown into jail for a Facebook comment about the government. I thought, oh my lord, I better get on the plane and get out of here, man. We're happy you're but, here. Yes, yes, <laughs> I survived, thank God. But, but I think the point is exactly what you're saying, is that when we think about some of these developmental areas, there are core you know, infrastructure-related you know, waste management, uh, water, you know, water is a, is a big issue. Um, these are the kind of things that I think are, are crucial. So, and again, we'll, we'll touch on some of that here in a minute in the next round of the megatrends. More questions? I'll connect to the ladies' uh, question before about corruption. What, uh, how do you see the risk about the manipulation of these mega cities uh, due to really these smart issues of all? meaning that you have then the possibility to control everything from one head above. 
How do you see that, the risk of <laughs> manipulation? Well, I'll be a little risky. Last week, I emceed a conference in Moscow. And Moscow and, you know, the whole Russian environment, phenomenal market. But what do we see? We see the perpetuation of a status quo and the cabinet that was just announced a couple of days ago is essentially a status quo cabinet. And so, you know, when you look at Russia, you look at, you know, corruption writ large. You look at Moscow and you look at corruption writ large. I mean, the number one mafia guy probably is the guy running the country. <laughs> and, and the reality to that is that represents ex uh, exactly the same kind of thinking you have. I have to ask the question, with all the great human capital in the Russian Federation, with the genius for scientific innovation that led the Soviet Union to where it was 50, 60 years ago, you know, with all of that potential, the single greatest inhibiting factor, I think, is this issue of corruption and sort of the massive command and control structure. And in fact, our event there was about unleashing innovation. And when I was done with the whole event, I had this very dour-faced Russian man stand up and say, I want to speak. And as an MC of the event, you're going, oh my gosh. <laughs> But we invited him up, and he came up and he spoke in Russian to the audience for a while. And basically what he said was exactly this. He said, this is what Russia needs. We need fresh thinking. We need innovation. And, you know, I found out later he's the head in the Russian Federation of small and medium cities. And he loved the smart city stuff. So there's such, there are such forces underneath in Russia that want to burst through some of the challenges and really lead to a new future. But the corruption, the command and control from the top could be the single biggest inhibiting factor. And that, of course, is not just true in Russia. It may be true in other countries as well. You know, I, it's going to be fascinating to watch in China how the Central Committee manages the greatest capitalistic economy in the world that's still called communist, right? It's fascinating. This is actually a great bridge to one question I just need to ask. Okay. You said that 38% of the population in India is going to be urbanized by 2025. Yeah. That's a huge amount of people. Yeah. But if, if my math is not completely wrong, the rest of the people is even more. What's going to happen and what are going to be the requirements from the people not living in the urbanized areas 2025 compared to where we are today? Well, this is very interesting to me, Peter. I was thinking the exact same thing when I was presenting this, is what that's, that data point actually tells you is that the vast majority of the population will still be out in the rural, the small cities, but mostly the rural agrarian type economy. And I think that to me is India's fundamental challenge. I mean, you have places like Chennai and Bangalore, you know, that are just gangbusters, that are amazing places of development. But what about the rest? And I think that is one of the biggest questions both for India and China. It's how to make the lifestyle and the, act, you know, the, the opportunity to acquire wealth you know, available to the, to the rural population, which is huge, as well as the burgeoning urban population. That to me is, is the issue because, you know, the, the standard of living is so dramatically different. And I think that is a crucial uh, issue that we'll talk about again here in a couple minutes. Good. Thank you, Dorman. I will actually end this session right now. Of course, we have more okay. of the program. You will come back on stage later on today as well. Yes, I'll be back, and we'll talk about some other mega friends. Thank you.